This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Excellent. Okay, well today we have Katerina Liskova from Marsik. Masaryk. Masaryk University. Um, he's going to present on Sex Backwards, Sexology Speaks About Desire in Communist Czechoslovakia. Uh, Katrina is Assistant Professor in Gender Studies and Sociology at Masaryk University. Um, she's also held posts at Columbia University, Imre Kurtz's colleague in Germany and New York University, including the Marie Curie Fellowship at Columbia and the Fulbright, uh, the New School for Social Research. Her papers have appeared in several monographs published by Routledge, Sage, Blackwell and Palgrave. Her book, Good Girls Look the Other Way, Feminism and Pornography, was published in 2009, and her forthcoming book is titled Sex Under Socialism, From Emancipation of Women to Normalised Families in Czechoslovakia. I'll hand over to you. Thank you. So I'll be talking about how Czechoslovakians came to sex backwards, and I'll be contrasting two periods, the beginning of the communist regime and the first dozen or so years, 1948 through early 60s and the other period will be the 70s. And I'll be talking about two things, married sexuality it, and at each period, and sexual deviance at each period. So, to get started, Czechoslovakians came to sex backwards compared to, let's say, Westerners, achieving gender emancipation long before sexual liberation. Moreover, sexual liberation did not come as a result of a popular demand from below, but rather came from above. In the early years of communism in the 50s, women were equal to men not only at work and according to the law, but also in expert discussions of sexuality and marriage. Sex experts discussed sex in connection with love within an egalitarian marriage and included a woman's equal right to orgasm. A sexual deviance was not a priority. Sexologists even pushed for the decriminalization of homosexuality at this time, in the 50s. But by the late stages of socialism, when the West was experiencing sexual and then gender liberation, equality disappeared from Czechoslovak sexology. A successful marriage was reframed as hierarchical, family became privatized, and was strictly separated from the public realm of work. Individual therapy replaced public equality. Utopian models of a new and just society disappeared as both individuals and society at large settled for privatized solutions to any and all social ailments. Hundreds of sexually dysfunctional couples came to the treatment in new marriage counseling centers or inpatient facilities in the 70s and 80s. Dozens of sexually deviant men who could not or did not live up to the family norm, were sentenced and placed in the sexological wards of psychiatric hospitals established in the 1970s. The case of Czechoslovakia shows that histories of sex and gender are more complex and diverse than the narratives of linear advancement most Western theories suggest. Studying sex during communist rule reveals an alternative modernity as it unfolded in Eastern Europe. Normative ideas about sexuality in Czechoslovakia in the second half of the 20th century were to a large extent shaped by a group of doctors working in a sexological institute based in Prague. Oh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> so the institute uh, of sexology. Oh, did I? Okay, no, 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 it's, it's, it's even further, so we need to go back. Wow. Yeah, keep it this way, it looks good <laughs> to me. Okay. It was founded in 1921, and it was the world's first university-based center for sexual science. It was founded only two years after the famous Magnus Hirschfeld private Institute für Sexualwissenschaft in Berlin. So ours was public university-based, thus the primacy. The Prague Institute resumed operations after World War II, and since then, since 1945, it has been working on uninterruptedly, which is somewhat unique in a communist country, given that uh, other disciplines focusing on on humans in their social interactions, like sociology, psychology, philosophy, they all were interrupted several times during the regime's existence, not sexology. So uh, as of 1945, this institute worked 
there was a main doctor, Josef Hinie, who uh, had his collaborators around him. You see their names and you will be hearing from those folk tonight. Um, and those people worked together until they died. They, they did not go away, which is another interesting thing. They did not leave or move to another, let's say, medical specialty. They kept working together, which makes it uh, interesting to, to look what they were saying at different points in time. These doctors were coming from different medical backgrounds, and they engaged in research and clinical practice. They authored marriage manuals and device sex treatments, and over time connected with other medical experts forensic scientists and governmental policymakers and became ones themselves. So the discipline of sexology was institutionalized in the Institute and branched out. So in the later stages of the regime, from the 70s onwards, sexual advice got closer to people in counseling centers that sprang up in most bigger towns. Sexologists practiced in psychiatric hospitals and the discipline acquired licensing privileges as it became official medical specialty in postgraduate training, again in the 70s. Despite early post-war progressive impulses to redraw gender maps and sketch sexuality anew, Czechoslovak sexology by the early 70s shifted towards a disciplining and even punitive outlook. In the process, sexology became a contradictory authority one that praised and advanced the sexuality of some, while condemning and correcting the sexuality of others. Thus, coupled heterosexuality benefited from sexological advice to employ elaborate techniques. Uncoupled male heterosexuality at the same time, the 70s onwards, was sentenced to sexological control and rectification. Yet at the same time, male homosexuality, which had been criminalized at the beginning of the communist regime, was liberated in 1961 due to the efforts of sexologists who continued to shelter homosexuals from intrusive society until the end of the regime. The attempts to free women from traditional gender obligations that had characterized sexological writings in the early days of state socialism, as you will see, all but vanished in the later stages of the regime. Gender regressed, while sexuality transformed rather ambiguously. I link these changes to shifts in regime priorities. So, before we go into that, the quick timeline of Czechoslovak communism, yes. Only three dates important at this point. 1948 is the year when communists seized the power monopoly in the country. So two years after the first democratic elections, in 1948, communists had the entire control. 1968, as you might know, is the Prague Spring, which failed, and Soviet-led tanks invaded the country. And as of 1969, until pretty much the end of the regime in 89, the time is called normalization, and I will speak more about that later. And it is interesting also because of sexual deviance on the backdrop of normalization, which I will talk about. So after the failure of the Prague Spring in 68, a hardline pro-Soviet wing of the party regained power. These new leaders enacted a new policy calling for the normalization of conditions. These are their words, thus the name of the period. They named it themselves. Men and women were encouraged to mind their own business at home and beyond. Atomized families were pretty much held hostage by the omnipotent state, and people were expected to obey this authority and seek fulfillment outside the public sphere, especially in families. For you here today, I do not need to explain why sexology is important, what role this faculty and Ciencia Sexualis plays in the everyday life of people, and what kind of tool it presents for the state in governing its population. Let me just invoke Nicholas Rose and his concept of PSY ANSYS, the disciplines such as psychology, psychiatry, psychotherapy, which he puts at the heart of social organization of modern societies. Rose, however, connected PSY ANSYS exclusively with the liberal West. I argue that the PSY ANS of sexology was present and indispensable for the Czechoslovak regime as it attempted to mold selves compatible with its changing priorities. So sexologists aspired to institutionalize their branch of medicine and thus strengthen its standing. Since the early 60s, they called for a more systematic presence in medical schools, 
while optional lectures on sexology became available to students of the Prague Medical School as early as 1934, they remained only elective until 1975. At that time, sexology finally became a specialization in postgraduate programs, as I mentioned at the beginning, typically for students studying psychiatry. So psychiatrists, sexologists, sometimes gynecologists, those, those were the medical specialties uh, for doctors. Within the structure of the medical profession, sexology was closely connected to gynecology as of the very beginning, and later on to psychiatry. Both of these disciplines opened their professional associations to sexologists in the late 60s, before sexologists established their own organization in 1970, which was again a highlight of their institutionalization. Sexology had its base in the capital city and in the 70s began branching out into regional towns. The year 1974 marked two important developments. The first was the foundation of the first sexological center at an outpatient clinic outside of Prague. And further expansion into virtually all the regional centers followed within three short years. So over 20 years, very few sexological centers outside of the capital. And then between 74 and 77, they were everywhere. Further expansion into virtually all the region centers followed. And the second important step that happened in 74, uh, on the road towards in institutionalization, was issuing the policy document by the Ministry of Health called Guidelines of Sexology Methods and Measures. And that document allowed for special sexological wards to open within psychiatric hospitals. These wards typically confined sentenced sexual deviants and sometimes served as a training ground for sexually dysfunctional couples. I will mention both. Sexology's full integration into the healthcare system was completed in 1981 when the Czechoslovak Ministry of Health, supported by the World Health Organization, legislated sexology as part of healthcare services. So let me focus now on the changes to the views on family and intimacy and views on sexual deviance as they changed over time. So I identified two distinct periods, the long 1950s, beginning at 48, going somewhat into early 60s, 61, 62, maybe 63, and a normalization beginning in the 70s and going pretty much until the end of the regime. So let's start with sex, love, and the family. The world after the war changed profoundly. A sentiment prevailed in many countries, including Czechoslovakia, that the order of things needed to change in a major way. Those who were on top should be on the bottom, those who were on the bottom need to rise to the top. A new basis for citizenship was codified already in 1945 in what was called Košice government program, according to the city in which it was signed. And this government program envisioned the equality of women and social benefits for all citizens. Communists overwhelmingly won the first democratic election in 1946, but they were not ruling the country by themselves. Other parties, including Christians, formed the first after-war government, which attempted to set a new tone to the family life. Where communists presented rather modernist policies, such as simplification of divorce or equalizing the status for out-of-wedlock children, other parties objected, suggesting to keep the previous law, which cemented the traditional family. The government discussed bills introducing mandatory eugenic screening after the war that was supposed to come before marriage. And that was proposed by population experts that advised to conservative ministers. In contrast, sexologists tended to refuse such measures as illiberal and medically unsound and withdrew from governmental committees in protest. Public discourse shifted with the communist takeover in 1948. Government reshaped the family with loans for newlyweds designed to do away with the dowry and class endogamy, supported women's inclusion in the labor force, simplified divorce, tried to collectivize housework, and banned the eugenic society. Medical experts battled to reduce infant mortality and promoted women's health. Step by step, abortion was legalized in 1957. Sexologists, together with many gynecologists, argued for the legalization on the grounds of women's well-being and reproductive freedom. 
Sexologists did not limit their efforts to governmental expertise, clinical research, and scholarly journals. Already in the 50s, they started publishing marriage manuals, which drew growing attention over time. I will talk more about this one, first issued in 1955, Sexual Life and Education Towards Marriage and Parenthood Guide for Educators, Teachers and Parents. While advising on issues of married life, sexologists in the 1950s also stressed the emancipation of women. They argued that a successful marriage was based upon equality and romantic love that conjoins two halves of the same soul in the lasting union. Sex was to be enjoyed between loving equals, where men and women were free of the shackles of bourgeois property. Before entering marriage, people were advised to get to know each other in the workplace and at collective volunteer work units. Here's a quote from the book. Relationships today have much brighter prospects for assessing a companion's character because they are based in real workplace experience, work in organizations, political training, where one can get to know the real character of a person without distortion. Both partners meet as equal and free citizens without heeding any economic dependency. This is only possible in socialism, which frees women for the first time in history. So these authors are, uh, as you saw, the members of the Sexological Institute in Prague, Bartak and Adoman, and their colleagues. So the importance of work in the 1950s was paramount, and the public realm of work was tightly linked to the intimate life of the family. Constricted political climate of capitalism was blamed for constricting the sexual freedom of the woman. Another quote from the same book. Only female proletarians and poor peasant women took part in the work process, however, they could only hold lower posts in factories and fields, meaning during capitalism. Their work was more exploited than the work of men because they were paid less for the same work than men were. In bourgeois marriage, the woman was assigned to the household and child rearing. Economically, she was completely dependent on man. The freedom of choosing a partner often yielded to economic pressures, and the choice was frequently exercised by parents. Spouses then matched economically, rarely in mental traits. Such a marriage was a prison for the man, however, even more so for the woman, because she was not as free as man. In case of breaking marital fidelity, society strictly denounced the woman while tacitly tolerated the man. As early as 1952, Sexologists focused on female pleasure. Originally, they wanted to understand the connection between a woman's orgasm and conception. Shortly, though, their aim shifted and they were exploring the underpinnings of female sexual pleasure. In the socialized medicine of early 1950s Czechoslovakia, women with difficulties bearing children underwent treatment at the Frankiško Vilázně Spa. Between the years 1950 and 1952, Almost 11,000 women from all walks of life and from all over the country sought to be cured there. About 19% of them did not show any somatic problems, which confounded local gynecologists. Many of those women complained of various deficiencies in their sex lives and blamed their sterility on these shortcomings. Sexologists from the Prague Institute were summoned to shed light on the problem. They designed a comprehensive survey of female patients and constructed a control group of pregnant women to compare their findings. Their conclusion was that the infertile women's marriages were deficient, suffering in particular from a lack of romantic involvement. They found that in 20% of married couples that could not conceive, five times higher than in married couples currently expecting a child, the wives did not love their husbands. Half of them felt even hostile towards them. Doctors suggested what they called marital adjustment, meaning more loving involvement in the marriage, to improve sex lives of these women. At the end of the decade, a conference was held devoted solely to the problem of the female orgasm. One doctor captured the feelings of most, saying, quote, what scientifically proven findings do we have about women's attitudes to intercourse, attitudes which in many cases are so negative?" End quote. Conference records reveal that one doctor firmly stated that women have the right to sex because they're equal to men. However, he also held that most women longed for sex solely because they wanted to get pregnant, that their sex lives were the product of psyches structured to be maternal rather than lustful. 
Another doctor, female, insisted that men needed to participate in housework and raising children and only this would unlock the orgasm for women. The opinion still prevailed that marital sex lives could only be salvaged through improved loving relationships. Moreover, sexologists explicitly warned against the idea that working on technique, and we are at the end of the 1950s, working on technique could enhance sex. They argued only a new type of family with equal partners who were committed and loved each other could cure sexual ailments, particularly those of women. So now wait for the next installment of couple therapy until we discuss the 70s. By the mid-1960s, uh, experts began to question various policies concerning women and the family. Was it really healthy for infants to be placed in nurseries, they asked. Shouldn't the access to abortion be limited? Remember, as of January 1st, 1958, women in Czechoslovakia could uh, access abortion and uh, they, the experts were tweaking the, the access and they were considering limiting it even more uh, fully. They were thinking about how to stop the population from decreasing, because it was on steady decline as of the early 50s, and how to make people, and especially women, want more children. So these debates were going on as of early to mid 60s, 63, 64, 65, but no major changes in the overall population policies were accepted before the early 70s. Then, a host of interventions that had been proposed by various experts for about a decade suddenly became reality. Generous, generous loans for newlyweds were offered and those who immediately started a family were partially exempt from paying back. Paid maternity leave got extended to 26 weeks or up to two years if the mother was raising another preschooler. State allowances for a second child quadrupled for a third were almost eight times higher in comparison with allowances for an only child. In 1971, maternity bonus was significantly increased. Housing became more readily available, while in 1965 only about 12% of newlyweds had a separate household. In 1980, 85% of young married couples could enjoy the privacy of their home. The material infrastructure of private family was built. The discursive building blocks of privatized family were created also. Sexologists published new marriage manuals that became an instant hit. Some editions vanished from bookstores within short weeks, and I'll be specifically talking about one which vanished f within a month and became immensely popular <coughs> in the 70s and 80s. The ideal marriage described in these books looked markedly different. Books published in the 70s insisted on the necessity of gender hierarchy for a successful marriage and defended privatized families isolated from larger society. Men and women were painted as fundamentally different, with men superior to women. Sexologists now warned that if gender arrangements departed from this design, women would suffer pain similar to sexual dissatisfaction. If women observed the proper, meaning traditional, gender order, and together with their husbands practiced the elaborate techniques described in the manuals, all could enjoy a happy and fulfilling sex life. So now the bestseller of the 70s, Young Marriage, and uh, also quotes from a pamphlet uh, from sexual education book published in 1977. These, all these authors are doctors working at the Sexological Institute and Bartak, the author of the Sex Ed pamphlet, was also co-author of the books that I talked about in the 50s. So the interpenetration of love and work, the intimate and the public, calls for social change and the emancipation of women were all but gone in the 1970s. Sexologists outlined the one and only course a relationship should take. The very same author, Bartak, who co-authored the treatises of the 1950s, wrote two decades later, first lovers, later spouses, and finally parents. This is a natural developmental process for human sexual and love relationships. Family, according to him, in the 70s was supposed to be, quote, a safe haven in our mechanical and automatized world, end quote. 
and sexuality in his account got reduced to procreation because, quote, men and women can only live sexually when they take into account all possible outcomes, that is, having children and raising and taking care of them, end quote. Also, there was a danger lurking for women in sex that supposedly stemmed from what he called the natural inequality of the sexes. In a widely read book, Young Marriage, by Melan and Shipova, sexologists who worked uh, in the Institute, this book provided sexual and relationship advice to newlyweds. The authors tacitly presupposed inequality and difference between potential partners and strove to provide advice on how to choose a partner so that inequalities balance themselves out. Some characteristics, however, cannot be put in harmony. Quote, the situation is easier for couples where the man has a higher intellect than the woman. These settings complement the patriarchal family system. It, it, it is truly a stumbling block if the situation is reversed. The intimate landscape painted in this book was the one where the home presented an island of safety, security and authenticity pitted against the outside world, particularly the workplace. Quote, if troubles arise in the workplace, one gets all the more attached to his partner. His desire for understanding increases in proportion to failures in relations with people outside marriage. The need for love in marriage grows." End quote. The public sphere threatens an individual with failure that can only be ameliorated in private. Moreover, it is not only work which is alienating. Other people, in fact anyone who is not one's spouse, is considered a stranger. Such a vision is profoundly antisocial. Together with the privatization of intimacy and gender freeze, there came an accent of, on sexual techniques in the 1970s. And here's our next installment on sex therapy. Sexologist Stanislav Kratochvil brought Masters and Johnson style therapy to Czechoslovakia. Kratochvil practiced behavioral training in detailed sexual techniques at a curious place, at a psychiatric hospital. A special state-of-the-art facility was opened in the neurotic ward of the psychiatric hospital in a small Moravian town of Kromnerish in 1973. In the following five years, 70 couples were admitted for a fortnight stay where they were treated for problems such as erectile dysfunction in men or anorgasmia in women, with 83% and 70% respective success rates. Uh, very similar to Mass and Johnson, actually. Sex therapy fashioned uh, on the model of Mast and Johnson soon became available to dissatisfied couples in six other outpatient clinics across the country. Kratochvil, the sexologist who devised and oversaw the therapies, highlighted lack of privacy as one of the chief reasons for sexual failings. He urged his patients and married people in general to have sex behind locked doors. He even enhanced the material infrastructure of the hospital by building soundproofed houses on, on the premises of the hospital in which the couples could practice sex according to his advice, step by step. They were given pictures, they were given instructions, and they spent the night and then the following day they shared their um, views and, and feelings with the therapist and in a group therapy, somewhat more public uh, aspects of their uh, marital lives. So this accent on privacy was very important for Kratochvil, and even not only uh, metaphorically, but also in material uh, settings. This metaphor of locked doors connected sexual happiness with the severe privatization of lives that became the order of the day under normalization in the 70s Czechoslovakia. During normalization, sexual betterment through techniques became discussed while gender equality was no longer seen as, an, as realistic or even desirable. So now that we saw what normal sex is uh, supposed to be like, what about the non-normal, deviant sexuality? Despite its historical focus on aberrant sexual behavior, sexology as a discipline had Sexology in the 50s uh, Czechoslovakia barely dealt with sexual deviance. Sexologists treated only isolated instances of deviance and those rare cases that went to court were typically there because they harmed work and the national economy. 
The new penal code of 1950 no longer recognized sexual intercourse with animals as a punishable offense. While still in the sexological register as zoophilia, such conduct clearly did not interfere with the dignity of another person because the new penal code of 1950 uh, did away with a uh, bourgeois obsolete category of uh, morality and focused on the dignity of man. So zoophilia, clearly not interfering with the dignity of man, uh, fell out of the purview of the law. Such approach echoed in an unusual case of zoophilia, which came to courts in the early 60s. A man working on a collectivized farm abused cows by sticking pitchfork into their behinds. This behavior brought sexual satisfaction to him that he came to prefer over, over an intercourse with his wife. His conduct was punished, but not because it would be considered sick, disgusting, or generally undignified. Sex experts did not even highlight his alienation from the marital bed. The court convened and sentenced the perpetrator because the behavior in question damaged the national economy, because the cows were in collective property of the state, of all people. Sexologists in the 50s did not perceive homosexuality as a criminal offense, but it was still on the books. They knew that, quote, an exclusively homoerotic person could not be attuned to heterosexuality. We cannot cure him by prescribing him to get married. Sexologists pushed for decriminalization of homosexuality, which was accomplished in 1961. However, selling sex was seen as deeply problematic. Homosexual prostitutes were perceived as, quote, antisocial types who recoil from work and who, themselves heterosexual, can take an advantage of their homosexual victims and interfere with their biographies, often with tragic consequences." End quote. More important than sexual proclivities was the working status of the person. Not to work in a proper socialist way constituted a crime. According to the same logic, however, quote, an appropriate life of a worker could be a mitigating circumstance. End quote. The import of work paramount. A 15-year-old boy who was brought to the Sexological Institute for examination by his mother, who was worried about her son's excessive masturbation, uh, was another interesting case of homosexuality and work in the 50s. Doctors found out that the boy had been having homosexual intercourse with adult men for over a year. Doctors were not appalled by the possible abuse. The guy was 15, 14. They were not afraid the boy's future homo uh, heterosexuality might be compromised by his homosexual conduct. They concluded, quote, such relations are always morally harmful to the youth because they get used to an effortless gain which makes their social inclusion difficult, end quote. Sexual deviance in general was only visible when it endangered work and the economy. Two decades later, the situation was decidedly different. In the 70s, hundreds of men were sentenced and sent for treatment to special, newly established sexological wards in psychiatric hospitals. Sexologists collaborated with courts, striving to bring the sexologist terminology of diagnoses and aberrations in line with the criminological lexicon of law-breaking and misconduct. Sentenced men who became sexological inmates did not exhibit distinct symptoms, but were, according to doctors, serving as forensic experts, showing, quote, general signs of social maladaptation and did not know how to treat a woman. Being only 21 years old, an unskilled worker stood before court for the third time for sexual aggression towards a woman. When he was first sentenced as a 16-year-old, the court requested a psychiatric evaluation. The doctors then concluded that the young man exhibited sadistic and pedophilic features, which, however, did not result in diminished penal responsibility. Sexologists did not agree with psychiatrists. The man in question was not diagnosable in terms of pedophilia or sadism, said sexologists, and they were really worried that what were the psychiatrists doing anyway, uh, using sexological terminology to diagnose this man. 
Sexologists kept arguing that the man was sexual deviant for, quote, his complete lack of effort to enter into normal relationships, end quote. We do not know what uh, happened to this particular recidivist sexual aggressor, as he was labeled. In case he was sentenced, he might have been sent to a new protective treatment facility that was opened for cases like his as part of psychiatric hospital in Horní Beškovice in 1974-75. This center was the first of its kind in Czechoslovakia. 20 beds were available in Horní Beškovice for patients in protective custody that the local psychiatrist dubbed SOL patients, an acronym standing for Sexologická ochrana léčba, SOL, which means Sexological Protective Treatment. Who were these patients? According to their doctors, quote, the SOL patients are the true sexual deviants only in a minority of cases. Mostly, they are sexual delinquents in the broadest sense, end quote. What is the difference between deviants and delinquents? What purpose does this distinction serve? Delinquency comes from the Latin delinquere, which means to transgress, offend, and generally error. The delinquents in Horní Beškovice seem to have done as much. Or rather, the authorities, be it legal or medical, saw the transgression even where the supposed transgressor often did not. The biggest problem doctors tackled was not how to diagnose and treat a particular medical problem, but rather how to make the inmates see the ways in which they wronged society and how they should correct their behavior. To achieve that aim, doctors devised a three months long program that consisted of what they called a firmly structured schedule. Doctors delivered lectures to patients, organized collective TV watching, and every two weeks there was, quote, an evening entertainment to which female patients from other parts of the psychiatric clinic were invited. What they tried to do was to socialize patients into orderly workings of society. Watching TV and dancing with women was to teach the inmates about normal ways of conduct that are specific to the private family realm. While the biggest problem of the inmates in Horní Beškovice was their failings in the private realm of interpersonal relationships, particularly towards the members of the opposite sex. Their functioning in the public realm was impeccable. Doctors mentioned that, quote, their attitude to work was not a stumbling block for the majority of soul patients, end quote. Thus, a fuzzy category of sexual delinquency was born, one which disciplined men, men who were deemed unwilling or unable to live a family life. While trying to correct delinquents, sexologists grew understanding and even protective of homosexuals. At first, sexologists, and now we are coming back to the 50s to give you an account of homosexuality and the perception of homosexuality by Czechoslovak sexologists. At first, sexologists sought to diagnose and treat men sexually interested in other men. Scientific methods soon persuaded the doctors of the futility of such a quest and they went on to lobby for the legalization of homosexuality and later protected their homosexual patients from state's intrusion. Between 1950 and 1958, psychiatrist and sexologist Kurt Freund, who was uh, of German Jewish origin but uh, lived and, and, and worked in Prague, developed his study of male homosexuals. At the Sexological Institute in Prague, Freund invented a diagnostic device that traced sexual arousal in men by following the changes in the volume of their penis. He called the device phalloplatismograph. During a diagnostic session, a man was screened images of naked men and women while the machine recorded his penile reactions. This variant of lie detector was trusted to reveal the truth of the man's sexual self. At first, Freund and his colleagues attempted to cure a diagnosed homosexual. They used a combination of aversion therapy and hormonal conditioning. First, they induced nausea by infusing a drug cocktail into the patient while he was getting aroused by the images of men, so that he got to associate homosexual arousal with vomiting. Second, they tried to make him interested in the members of the opposite sex by administering testosterone and engaging him in group talks and practical advice, whatever that was. 
This therapy brought very poor results. Within five to eight years, only 12 out of 63 patients showed some form of heterosexual adaptation, for example, got married. But all remained attracted to other men. Freud became persuaded that homosexuality was a permanent state and could not be treated. He and his fellow sexologists thus pushed for decriminalization of homosexuality, which was accomplished in 1961. And this lovely device uh, traveled with uh, Kurt Freund to Canada, where he emigrated in 1968, and he made it famous, essentially. Uh, he worked as a sexologist in Toronto in Clark Institute, and the Kurt Freund Laboratory bears his name until this day and the device is used in North America, in the Czech Republic and a couple other countries. And it, it has its history, uh, which is interesting in and of itself, but it's truly a Czech invention. So given this history of already in the 50s, doctors accepting homosexuality and pushing for decriminalization, uh, we can appreciate that the world, uh, even the scientific world, perceived homosexuality as a disease for much longer. Only in 1973, as you well know, did the American Psychiatric Association declassify homosexuality as a mental disorder, and it took the World Health Organization 17 more years to follow suit. So Czechoslovak sexologists in the 70s, when the scientific world was you know, saying, okay, homosexuality is not a disease, then they were perfectly fine and persuaded that homosexuality was an innocuous variant of sexuality and sheltered their patients. Some gay men today recall how sexologists hid the medical files of homosexuals, of themselves and, and, and their friends, from the secret police and reminisce about sexological group therapy in the 70s as the first gay dating site. And the, the, here I'm referring to the oral histories conducted by my colleague, historian Vera Sokolova. So, the 1950s prioritization of work and economy faded over time, while in the 70s, failures in heterosexual coupling came to the forefront. It was no longer enough to express loyalty to the regime by being a diligent, hardworking citizen. Being a normal person in Czechoslovakia's normalization era meant, above all, to participate in the family. Demographic changes that accelerated in the 60s particularly skyrocketing divorce rates and plummeting birth rates, made it, made it imperative for the government to focus on promoting the family. But it was not only these demographic changes that did that, because the birth rate was steadily going down as of 1950, and it was communists themselves who legalized, uh, or, or who, who liberalized divorce in 63 and then in 65, despite the numbers, and they, they were not uh, trying to retighten uh, the law, so they were kind of battling their own uh, decisions. The new pro-Soviet government installed after 1968 just focused on the family discursively and materially. During this time, during normalization, everyone who strayed from the family norm was suspected of deviance. This normalcy shaped its citizens into family men and women who would stay at home, never again tempted to fill the streets and squares to demand political changes. Czechoslovak sexology aided and abetted the criminalization of deviance. So, to conclude, in Czechoslovakia, intimacy was publicly mediated through sexological discourses on the proper form of marriage, while sexual identities were shaped by clinical interventions into orgasmic capacities or sexological incarceration in psychiatric facilities. At the inception of communism, love, sex and family were understood in close connection to the public world of work. Intimacy in the 1950s was closely related to the broader society and its political economy. Socialist subjects were constructed as authentic in the public realm of work and equal to one another, including gender equality. When normalization arrived in the 70s, intimacy was severely privatized. Close ties were to be enjoyed only in the safety of a family circle detached from the workplace. The authentic self was to be cultivated within domestic confines. When accounting for Eastern sexual trajectories, what is perhaps most striking is the reversed order of sexual liberalization with sexual conservatism in Czechoslovakia as compared to the West. 
Czechoslovak experts in the 50s discussed sex in the atmosphere of women's emancipation, the restructuring of gender and class relations, and reframed issues of sex in the public context while at the same time women in the West were typically being pushed out of wartime jobs, back into families, and sex was rarely mentioned in public. Yet in the 1970s, when the feminist movement came into full force in Western countries, Czechoslovakia was caught in the grips of normalization where sexual life was limited to the privatized terms of family. In broader terms of societal arrangements, however, the chasm between two societies organized around different political economies diminished over time. Czechoslovakia in the 1970s became decidedly structured along the public-private divide. Intimacy was reformulated as a private enterprise, the space where the state leaves you alone and where one's authentic self can be cultivated. This understanding divorced people from extra-familial engagements and inadvertently put social organization more in sync with the Western model. These two systems were brought closer by the vehicle of therapeutic discourse. In this regard, the Czechoslovak development towards therapeutic individualism coincides with that of the West. However, while in the West, this individualizing therapeutic culture went hand in hand with the rise of neoliberalism, in Czechoslovakia, the privatization of personal relationships cultivated an atomized state of late socialism. Nevertheless, both shared a similar therapeutic self-understanding. In fact, I argue that this helped ease the transition to Western modes of being after the collapse of socialist political economy in 1989. Thank you.